think you all are aware we've got it looks like a ballroom here. Um, <laughs> the baccalaureate thing today for the schools is this afternoon. So uh, if you can help a little bit after this service where you, the chairs need to be put up and the instruments moved down into the little room and so on. But uh, all of that's this afternoon. Now at the 11 o'clock service we will honor our graduates and we'll honor, uh, we'll have our confirmation class joining the church this morning. And then next Sunday, we've got the uh, folks, um, new members joining. And we've got quite a few that are uh, going to be uniting with the fellowship of our church. So it uh, looks like it's going to be a, a good uh, Sunday after the school, after school closing. Yeah. <laughs> so school's out this week, so let's pray for parents who will not <laughs> have their children at home all day. <laughs> uh, let's pray for teachers to get rested and relaxed uh, yeah. during the summer so they can start school in August, is that right? Man. Yes, yeah. early August. Seems like the summer's just gone from what it used to be. Uh, anyway, those are the main things. No more uh, Wednesday night <coughs> suppers now until fall, so kind of keep that in mind. Um, and I think those are the main things you've got to remember. I have, I have. Um, yeah, don't forget if you didn't get your baby bottles last week, please pick, pick them up this week. We return them, fill them with your change and return them. On Father's Day. Uh, I'm oh, I'm sorry. I do hate it. I hate talking on this thing. Okay, I'll do this. All right. Um, again, the baby bottles. Pick them up if you didn't. Another announcement. Next Sunday, the 26th, which is the day before Memorial Day, you have the opportunity, and I hope you accept it, I hope you do it, to give to a very special fund. And that is, last year we did this, and we want to do it again this year. There's a program called the Strong Bonds Program. And what it is, chaplains from all over, military chaplains, bring men and women and their families who are going to be deployed overseas to Epworth by the Sea for a very spiritual, fun field, everything kind of great place to be, Epworth by the Sea. And um, when they come back, they are also taken by their chaplains to Epworth by the Sea for a, you know, rest. <laughs> Not a debriefing, but more of a relaxation again this time. But um, Epworth by the Sea gives them $5 little New Testaments and Psalms, the little bitty. And these are some of the only Bibles some of them may have in their family. So um, next week, if you would, write as many, you know they cost $5, as many Bibles as you would like to give and market military Bibles and if you want to give a check, just put in the memo. If you want to give cash, if you would, we'll have some little envelopes here like we have in the big church. Um, I know I always say big church. I'm sorry. Um, this is the blended service. That's the big church. Um, but we'll have those envelopes. Please mark on the outside military Bibles. But y'all, please give as you are so called to do. They are very special, and we want to help, help Epworth buy these. So thank you, and remember that's next week. And I'll make another announcement. I'm going to show a quick video, actually, of Atworth next Sunday.
just know that you're here. If you're a, 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 you're a new visitor, if you're a visitor, please make sure you sign and put your email address. We'll send you a little email and promise not to you know, spam you or, or send you the joke of the week or the soft story of the day. Or whatever. All right. We're going to take a moment to take up our tithes and offerings now as our chance to offer our first fruits.
one Sunday I'm going to request that uh, for the offertory that Tim do um, his Elvis Presley of How Great Thou Art. He's got a, he's got a neat, neat uh, Elvis imitation. And, uh, I think it would work for an offertory. <laughs> oh, wouldn't, wouldn't it? Give, give him just a little bit, just a preview. Just a little bit. All right. Since you asked so nicely. <laughs> and twisted my arm. <laughs> oh, Lord, my God. When I in all some wonder. <laughs> Isn't that good? Isn't that good? Yeah, see? Okay. Come, come back for more. There you go. Two lines at a time. And y'all have to come back next week. <laughs> <laughs> All right, great. Okay. Um, today is Pentecost Sunday, and it's the one year anniversary of this service to being here, and Tim and Annie being here, and Nancy, and Susan, and Scotty, and Rachel. And uh, so this is, uh, this is a one year anniversary. And we're a little over halfway to 55 or 50. So when we get 50, y'all, we're going to have lunch. Okay, so keep that in mind. That's a goal. We need to we need to hit that goal. This being Pentecost Sunday, I've got several things going through um, going through my head. I'm just going to I'm going to read the verses that have to do with uh, the Acts the second chapter, verses one through four, uh, as as the a text, but. I'm take off on, on several things, and this service will be a little bit different than the second service because I want to challenge young people uh, this morning. We've got four graduates that we're honoring, and then we've also got our confirmation class joining this morning. So um, our church has done a, done a wonderful job of preparing our confirmands, and we've got, I think we'll have all ten here this morning. What we say, you, do we have all ten? Nine. Nine will be here this morning, okay? And they've made uh, stoles and they'll each receive a stole and I want to thank uh, Celia and Nancy Schumann kind of hit it up the stole project so uh, we'll see uh, but anyway that that will be at the 11 o'clock service now uh, this as I say this being Pentecost Sunday there, there's some things that I want to challenge your uh, challenge your heart with this morning because the title for today is mediocrity your turning point you say what in the world is that about well and how in the world does that tie into uh, Acts the second chapter. Well, I'm not sure myself, but we'll see. No. <laughs> uh, Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Listen to these words. Because Luke wrote the book of Acts. Now, I think you're aware of that. Uh, Luke is the greatest contributor, volume-wise. number of words that are contributed to the New Testament come from Dr. Luke. Uh, he was a Gentile doctor. And um, Luke puts details in that nobody else does. John has certain things that he covers. Mark, from his perspective of being a young man, has things that he covers that nobody else does. So this comes from from uh, the the account of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost comes to us from the uh, from Luke's writings by the inspiration of the Spirit of God. It says, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven, as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the house, the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire. And one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, in connection with that, this being our one-year anniversary, I want to take you back to the anniversary of Pentecost. Hey, Jim, I'm getting just a little bit of a ring through the monitors. If you could pull the monitors down just a hair, it would. Uh, it's going through my head and with my sinuses it feels like a drum beat. <laughs> um, I want to take you back to the day that the that uh, Pentecost. This was the feast of Pentecost. What was the feast of Pentecost? Well, it was the day to remember for the Hebrew nation. It was the day to remember what happened when God gave the law to Moses when He called him up to the mountain. Now, remember remember the details of the things that that we just read in the second chapter. Um, they're, they're very significant. It says a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind filled the whole house where they were. 
there appeared unto them cloven tongues of fire. You'll notice that we use a cloven tongue in the Methodist symbol. We don't have one uh, right here in front of us, but we use the red, the cross and the flame. It's a divided flame. Uh, a lot of churches use the flame as a part of their symbol um, in, in defining, you know, using as a motto or as a symbol for their church the idea that the church is not complete without an understanding of, of the Trinity of God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, some churches have tended to emphasize more one than another as far as the theology is concerned. But we realize that there's got to be a completeness. No story is complete without all of the characters. No gospel story is complete without the power of the Spirit of God working in the hearts and lives of the disciples who became apostles to do the things that they did and for the spread of the church to happen. Now, I want to take you back, though, to the first time that, and it wasn't yet called Pentecost, it was later when God instituted the feast. He said, do this, and remembering this, but here it is in the 19th chapter of the book of Exodus. And listen to these things and see what you can pick out in your mind that are kind of similarities. Okay, Here's the 16th verse of the 19th chapter of the book of Exodus. Then it came to pass on the third day in the morning. Well, I probably need to set, before I go on, I probably need to set the context for this. The 19th chapter of the book of Acts is where Israel has come to Mount Sinai. Now, it's been a rocky journey, y'all. It hasn't been a smooth trip. Uh, it was leaving the land of Israel, uh, the land of Egypt, uh, 430 plus years, uh, most of that time in slavery, and now they've come to the place. They came to the Red Sea. You remember the, the story of the plagues, and you remember the Red Sea. Then you remember uh, the various times being without food, being without water. Now they've come to the base of a mountain. God has brought them on. He said, "Camp down here." And then He begins to tell Moses what He expects of him. But listen to the similarities between the two days. Then it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunderings and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and the sound of a trumpet was very loud so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet with God and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was completely in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. Its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace and the whole mountain, the whole mountain quaked greatly. And when the blast of the trumpet sounded long and became louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him by voice. Then the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai, on the top of the mountain, and the Lord called to Moses. Uh, the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. So you, you get the idea. There's fire, there's smoke, there's thunderings, there's lightnings, there's, uh, there's loud noise, and this is uh, some... Uh, 2,000 years before the time of Pentecost. Then all during that time they celebrate the Feast of Pentecost until this day in Acts chapter 2 when the rest of the story happens. Now, here's, here's the thing that I want you to understand. Fire on the outside or fire on the inside? Fire on the outside or fire on the inside? Fire on the mountain or fire in my soul? There's a difference. And for the Christian, the difference is what kind of life we determine that we're going to live in the power of God. Are we going to live a mediocre life as Christians? Or are we going to live the life of fulfillment that God has for us? Are we going to live uh, to serve Him? Are we going to live in the power of the Spirit of God? You see, some of us are living our lives with doing the same things over and over again. And you know that old definition, I don't need to repeat it, we've repeated it recently, the definition of insanity is just doing the same things over and over again, expecting different results. But listen to this, somebody wrote this, and I like what it expresses, uh, because in some ways it expresses what government is. <laughs> uh, on the other hand, it, it, can, uh, it expresses sometimes the futility of life. A farmer noticed a highway department truck pulling over on the shoulder of the road. A man got out and dug a hole and then got back into the truck. Then the other occupant got out, filled up the hole, and got back in the truck. Every 50 yards, this amazing process was repeated. What are you doing? The farmer asked. The driver replied, we're on a highway beautification project, and the guy who plants the trees is homesick today. <laughs> now, some of us feel like we're the ones digging the hole. <laughs> some of us feel like we're the ones covering up the hole, and somehow the tree planter's missing. Now, what, what happens in our lives, and I, and I love what somebody says, power, uh, power can be unleashed or it can be harnessed. When power is unleashed, what happens? Usually any kind of expression of power 
when it, it is set loose uh, and unharnessed, cre it creates a, a lot of damage. <laughs> Uh, take, for instance, the, the uh, atomic bomb. Uh, and, of course, that's ancient history now. But we don't have anything else to refer it to except what is described to us in words. And we can't get that picture in our minds. We cannot. We cannot even comprehend uh, what a hydrogen bomb would do in relationship to an atomic bomb. All we can do is multiply what we saw happen at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And we, we try to multiply that by 10 or by 100. And we can't do that. We can't do that and get an accurate picture in our mind. Much less can we get a picture in our mind of what a neutron bomb could do. If a nuclear neutron bomb were detonated anywhere in this area, it would kill all life forms without destroying the building. Explosion wouldn't be that big. But you see, the neutrons, the power in the neutron to be unleashed and just to race through this atmosphere at this particular point would kill all life forms, would kill everything that is alive. Wouldn't harm buildings, wouldn't harm inanimate objects, but it would kill everything. We've got that in our arsenal. Uh, other countries have the neutron bomb in their arsenals. We can't conceive of that kind of thing, but power unleashed usually leads to devastation. It leads to destruction, but power harnessed. You can take that same power and you can harness it you see, and you can put it into a nuclear reactor. And I, I really believe, I mean, for despite the fact of man's stupidity and people who do things that they, that they shouldn't do and people who don't follow through on responsibility that leads to destruction, it's one of the cleanest uh, forms of energy that there is. You can put a nuclear reactor on a submarine and you can send that submarine to sea. Now, they don't do this yet, don't need to, but you can put a nuclear sub at sea for three years without ever... Uh, and they say that the nuclear reactor on an, on an aircraft carrier can run that ship for the rest of natural life. And, uh, and, and, and just, you see, it's the difference between power harnessed and power that's unharnessed. Now, what does that have to do with our lives? Well, again, I take you back to the first Pentecost. This was the power of God displayed on a mountain. Mankind lived another 2,000 years learning in our relationship with God what God wanted from us. I don't understand the timeline. I don't understand the time frame. I don't understand what God had in mind. But it's God's mind, not my mind. And it took that time. It took that framework. It took that experience. It took all of that living of life by all of those people to come to the point in time where we are today. And what do we have? We have the opportunity to live above mediocrity. We have the opportunity to live with power harness in our lives when we sense what God wants to do through the power of the Holy Spirit. It's the difference between fire on the outside and fire on the inside and what happened at the day of Pentecost. Now, people get to a point in their lives. People get to a point in their lives where they say very often, and I hear, I hear people say this, I, I hear people say, I need something. I need something in my life. Um, was talking with a couple who were in a very desperate situation in their lives. And, uh, and both of them were saying separately, when I, uh, when I get people together for the first time and then I talk with them individually for a couple of times and we come together for a fourth time uh, to talk and then we meet separately again and then we come together for the fifth time to decide where we're going in the future, where we've gotten to at that point in marriage counseling. Now, and I was talking to a couple who were in a very desperate situation in their lives. And both of them were saying to me, and I was hearing what they were saying, I need something. I need something in my life. I need something. And what I was trying to say to them was to bring the harnessed power of God's energy, God's spirit into the situation and say to them, what you need is not something, you need someone. You see, it's not something that you need. It's not something else that you need. It's not another toy. It's not another person. It's not another relationship. It's not another job. It's not more money. What you need is not something else. What you need is someone else in your life. And it can make all the difference in your life. Listen to this quote somebody has said. When I, when I talk about mediocrity, your turning point, I'm, I'm coming to that in just a second. All good is hard. All evil is easy. Dying, losing, cheating, and mediocrity is easy. Stay away from easy. I like that. 
Only, listen to this, only mediocrity can be trusted to be always at its best. Isn't that interesting? Only mediocrity can be trusted to be always at its best. Listen to this quote. There are certain things in which mediocrity is not to be endured, such as poetry, music, painting, and public speaking. I like that. I like that. Mediocrity should not be endured. Now, let's... Let's bring this around to Pentecost because, you see, the disciples were at a place of mediocrity in their lives and they heard the call of God. This is what will happen in your life at some point. If it hasn't already, and maybe at some point you have heard this call to move beyond mediocrity to the next level of the Christian experience. Now, I like these, these discussions. I don't always agree with them necessarily. But I wrote on the front of the newsletter this week, moving to the next level, to the next level. We hear people talking. I watched a, a Joel Osteen the other night, uh, and I don't always agree with Joel Osteen's theology. Basically, I think he's headed in the right direction, but he refuses to talk about sin, refuses to talk about the blood covenant, refuses to talk about the idea that Christ died on the cross to save us from our sin. But he's very positive in his approach to life, and that's okay. Uh, we need that kind of thing in our world. But um, it, it just... It, it, the, the, the disciples had reached a place of mediocrity in their lives and in their experiences, and they needed something. They needed someone else in their lives. And the first, thing, the first point that I want to make to you very simply this morning is that you have to be able to distinguish between the good and the best. You will hear, maybe at some point in your life, you heard this voice speaking to you, saying, here's a decision that you've got to make. Are you going to go on to be the best? Or are you going to continue to live where you are? Are you going to move toward the things that God has for you? Or are you going to be content to stay where you are? And I would submit to you that the disciples had to make this decision in their lives. I went back and reread those passages, particularly in Matthew and Mark. And then John has a little passage, and he, he details it a little bit differently. He talks about Andrew going and getting his brother Simon. But I like the way that Matthew and Mark uh, talk about the fact that there was all of a sudden these disciples are in the midst of their everyday lives. They're fishing. They're on the Sea of Galilee. They're mending nets. That's what they were doing, the two, two groups that he called from the sea. They were fishing and they were mending their nets, Simon and, P, uh, Simon and Andrew and James and John. James and John were mending. Simon and, and Andrew were fishing. And in their, the living of their daily lives, they hear a call. Come and follow me. Drop your nets and I'll make you to become fishers of men. They had to decide at that point, am I going to continue in the life that I'm in, or am I going to follow God? Now, they followed the Lord Jesus Christ. They saw things that they never thought that they would see. They experienced things they never thought that they would experience. And finally, to them, it all ended in tragedy. They made a decision that they thought was going to take them to the next level. It was taking them to the next level. They didn't realize it at the time. They really thought that there was going to be a tremendous, a booming, fantastic finish to this story. I mean, with song, dance, instruments, and crowns, and thrones, and all of that. I mean, they pictured a big Hollywood ending to this story. And it didn't happen. It didn't happen. So they're faced with, are we going to go back to the mediocrity of our lives or are we going to stay on this path that God has set before us? And Jesus told them to go to Jerusalem and to wait. Now, they had to distinguish between the good and the best. There wasn't anything wrong with the lives that they were living. Listen, these were good Jewish boys. They were good Jewish boys. They lived in households of faith. They knew the scripture they could pray. They didn't pray like they wanted to. They didn't pray with power. And that's why they said to Jesus one day, teach us to pray. But these were good, solid, hardworking men. And they had to decide when all of this seemed to come to an end, were they going to go back? Were they going to go back to those lives of being good? Or were they going to continue to follow what God had laid out before them as far as what Christ was calling them to. Now, let me tell you, if they had all deserted, if they had all left, now, they did desert to a certain extent, but remember that Jesus told them, I mean, even though they fled in the garden, even though they weren't at the cross, 
and only piecemeal at the tomb. And finally, at the resu- as, as Jesus is, is resurrected and he's talking with them in the post-resurrection appearances, then there is some sense of, of positive things starting to come out of this. But Jesus had left them with the word. He said, go to Jerusalem and tarry until. Go to Jerusalem and wait until you receive the power of the Spirit of God. They had to decide, were they going to go with the good or were they going to go with the best? You have a choice in your life. Are you going to go with the good or are you going to follow the best? The second point that I want you to see this morning is that you have to want the very finest. If you want what God has for you, you have to want Him first. If you want what God has for you in your life, you have to want, first of all, Him. Now, I want to tell you that the decisions... And the ability, the, the desire to follow whatever it is that God leads us to is as varied as our fingerprints. Don't think that we all fit into the same mold of what God's best is for us. Don't think that it's the same thing as one size fits all of God's best. God's best for you and God's best for me is as unique as you and me are separately. And yet, in order to want, what God has for you. In order to want what God has for you that's the very best, we have to want Him first of all. And then the third thing that I want you to see this morning is that you have to get ready to get into the game. When the disciples were making the decision, Jesus said, go to Jerusalem and wait and wait for me until you're endued with power from on high. Let me suggest to you that they did things the rest of their lives that they could not do unless they had received the very best that God had for them, which on the day of Pentecost was being filled with the Spirit of God. There are things that God has for you for the rest of your life. I don't care how old you are chronologically, but there are things that God has for you for the rest of your life that you are not going to experience without the presence of the power of God operating in your life and moving in your life and through your life. You have to get ready to get into the game. Now, for the disciples, getting ready meant that they had to wait and they had to pray. And there was preaching, there was prayer, and there was power on the day of Pentecost. You know what? Sometimes preaching is boring to you. (laughs) Sometimes I present the most boring sermon you have ever heard. But I want to suggest to you that it's necessary in your walk with God to hear the word that is being poured into your spirit. Because it's coming from the word of God. If you ever hear me preach something, that's not to say all illustrations come from the word because they don't. But if you ever hear me preach anything that is not word based, that is not Bible based, then you ask me about it, you see. But you have to receive the word of God poured into your spirit you have to pray before God to receive the very best that he has for you and this is what was happening on the day of Pentecost there was the preaching of the power of God there was prayer and then suddenly here he was not here it was here he was in power in might and in strength there was no great physical feat on this day I don't know what the meaning of the of the flame was on top of the heads why did it distinguish their apostleship did it mark them as apostles I don't know I don't know it it just happened however it happened that happened and the important thing is that it happened that it happened to them because you see what happened is the disciples then were ready to get into the game up to this point they had not been ready to get into the game of evangelizing the world and that is the thing that is the most is the closest to God's heart is winning the lost and moving then Christians from an unsaved position to a saved position in their life and then moving them from beyond mediocrity into a spirit filled life And that's when mediocrity becomes our turning point as believers. If we decide that we want to continue to live the same mediocre Christian existence, or do we want the power of God into our lives? Now, I've read a lot of things. I've experienced a lot of things in my own life. 
And I love what A.W. Tozer said, one of my favorite Christian mystic uh, thinkers and theologians of the last century. And A.W. Tozer said, receiving the Spirit of God is very simply the act of breathing in and breathing out again. You just breathe in the Spirit. If God so has this power for you, and He does, then you pray and you say, Lord, here I am. Fill me. This vessel is ready for your use. I'm ready. Now listen, don't make this, don't have this desire, don't think that you want this desire unless you're ready to get in the game. I want this from you. I want the Spirit of God to fill my heart because I'm ready to get in the game. I've got family members that are lost without you. I've got neighbors that are lost without you. We live in a city that needs to know the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm ready to get in the game. Now listen, as soon as the Spirit of God filled them, you know, it's interesting to me, I used to be in a culture, I, 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 I lived in a culture that bounced off of uh, a lot of different expressions of theology in so many different ways. And one of the things that I think when I was young, there were people that were my age who wanted this, who said, you know, I just want the experience of being filled with the Spirit of God. But you know what? They weren't ready to get in the game. They wanted the experience, but they weren't ready to share what God had done in their hearts and their lives. And it wasn't until the disciples were... And what happened whenever they were filled? They stood up and began to speak Jesus. They began to preach the name of Jesus. And what happens when the name of Jesus is lifted up? People come to know Him. People come to accept Him. People come to know Christ and they're saved from eternal damnation to eternal life. And there's a difference, you see. You have to be willing and ready to get into the game. And I think that was a radical disconnect for so many people that I saw who experienced something that maybe wasn't exactly the thing that God had. It wasn't the very best that God had for them because while they had an emotional experience, they weren't ready. They weren't ready to get in the game. They weren't ready to be used, to be a vessel filled with the Spirit of God, cleansed and used by Him. I had a man the other day, I stopped into a local business. I'm not going to say where. It's kind of interesting. Uh, and I, I tell people, because it gives me an open door, I, I tell people I'm pastor at First Methodist Church. And I want you all to know I say that with pride. I really do. Because I'm proud of our church. I'm proud of the ministries that we're doing. I'm proud of the way that we're reaching out in so many ways. And I tell people because then I think it gives me an open, an open door to invite them to church, to invite them to know the Lord. And uh, this is what this guy said to me across the counter. He said, uh, I said, I'm a, I'm a pastor at First Methodist Church downtown next to Glen Academy. He said, really? He said, why haven't you witnessed to me yet? And without a blink. Now, listen, there was no guilt for me there. Because I'll tell you exactly what I told him. It came out just as soon as he said that. I said, I've been looking for an opening. And that's the truth. That's my heart. I said, I've been looking for an opening. Well, then it just opened up. Well, this was a believer. This was a, this was a man who was a believer. Now, I don't like to play games. He was playing a game with me. And that's okay. That's, that's, that may have been his thing. And he may have gotten a little tickle out of that. But that's okay. But there was no, there was absolutely no guilt on my part because I said to him just as soon as he said, why haven't you witnessed to me? And I said, I'm looking for an opening. You see, what he may not realize is that while he can be abrasive in his trying to witness to people, have that cactus with the sharp edges thing that, you know, you get to the heart of some cactuses, you can eat and you can drink out of the heart of a cactus, but you got to get through the spines, you know, you got to get through the prickly stuff. But the thing is that so many people can be turned off. And you have to look for that opening and you have to be led by the Spirit of God to sense when that opening is there. And that's exactly what I said to him and I meant it. I said, I've been looking for an opening. Well, that just opened up the whole and then we could communicate together as Christian believers. So, the thing is, do we want the fire on the outside? Listen, mediocrity is your turning point between moving from being, uh, living a mediocre Christian life to living a Spirit-filled life. Do we want just the fire on the outside? Or do we want the fire on the inside? Y'all come and sing one. Share with us.
you're willing and able, would you stand and join us? Our closing song is Who Shall I Fear? on our side. Father, help us to be willing in our lives to go to the next level with you through the power of the Spirit of God. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed.